Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner. I'm inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico from July 29 through August 2, 2024. Just visit Working Preachers homepage, click on the link under Preachers Retreat, and you can register. Space is limited, so sign up today. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. For the second Sunday in Lent on February 25th, 2024, the readings are Genesis 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16, Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31, Romans 4, 13 through 25, and Mark 8, 31 through 38. So we are really in Lent now, last week with the baptism and the testing in Mark. Uh, now, now we've jumped right ahead to thinking about the cross and really for four weeks, we're going to have different meditations on the reality that Jesus is going to die and ways the gospels try to uh, pull us into that and what it might mean and what we should expect, so. Well, yeah, welcome to Lent. But I'm glad you raised that, Matt, because one of the things that I was noticing in preparing for today and then and for this Sunday and then looking ahead for the rest of the Sundays of Lent is that, yes, that's right. There's, you know, clearly this focus on the cross, right? You've got to take up your cross and follow me and then uh, and then we'll be into um John 2, and then, you know, uh, the lifting up in John 3, and so on and so forth. But what I noticed, actually, in those passages that I'd like to carry through in our podcasting for the next uh, for the next couple of weeks is really how the cross and resurrection are being held together. I think that's one of the liturgical, theological challenges of Lent, is that we try to, or we have this tendency, I think, to think of, or to imagine the cross or to be on the road to lent as if it's as if it's a linear <laughs> a linear reality sort of a you know we're going to the cross we're going to the cross but in fact these passages are really holding intention the cross and the resurrection together and that's really more of what our life is is how is it that and our our life of faith is how is it that we that we have this um, emphasis, theological emphasis on the cross, but we also have the promise of the resurrection in the midst of that. And so that's where I'm kind of homiletically interested in right now with this Lent is because you, we have, you know, the passion predictions, right? So this is our, our passion prediction and um, <clears throat> in Mark and yet, but it's a passion and resurrection prediction, right? And the third day rise. And so how is it that maybe we can think about that a little bit more uh, of, of the kind of the mutual interpretive possibilities between cross and resurrection? And what does that mean for a life of faith and particularly what that might mean for Lent 2024? So first, ob first homiletical observation. I appreciate that. It's actually reading the text as we've received it. Um, so because of the crucifixion and the resurrection and the impact of Jesus' life, um, his story was continued to told and the community continued to grow. And when the story was told and then eventually written, it was written so that there, it was always written as in hindsight. It was always told in hindsight. You know, it, it was always, we're paying attention to what we remember happened because it, we only understood it after he rose from the dead. There, there are a couple of passages that even point that out. And particularly for those who've been in the church for a long time, but also maybe for how we introduce new followers, uh, new uh, members of our community, is to say, look back the way it was received in the first century. They knew Jesus was going to be crucified. They knew Jesus had died and had risen again. And they interpreted everything in light of that. So let's read those events 
in light of that? And what does that do to change our Lenten journey? Um, because we're looking at it as a fulfillment rather than an anticipation. It almost makes Lent a different journey than, uh, than uh, Advent. I think it's uh, the, that idea of hindsight is really important and how theology is always retrospective. It's, all, it's looking back and saying, oh, that's, that's why, or that's what happened, or there's a way in which God proved faithful in the midst of, of crisis. Here, one of the things that's fascinating to me is the, in verse 31, where it's that the, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering. Or, uh, you know, first year Greek students would say, you know, it is necessary that this must happen. And that little term can mean a lot of different things, dei in Greek, but it's, but there is, it does raise the question of what exactly is Jesus saying here in that must? And I don't want to hang our whole theology on just that, but to think about this idea of necessity or this idea of inevitability, uh, I, I would I think that all the gospel authors, if we could sit down and interview them, might have some particular Old Testament texts that they would want us to pay attention to. Mark doesn't give us that here. Jesus doesn't give us that here, nor really elsewhere in Mark's gospel. But to dwell with that for a little bit about, from our perspective, what's inevitable, what's uh, purposeful, what's even perhaps necessary about this way of death and resurrection without turning that into this notion of a sadistic God who just demands blood from somebody, but to, but to, um, but to sit there without pretending like we can penetrate the mystery of the cross to its, to its core. I think that's, uh, that's helpful too, Matt, when you think about, and I know we've talked about this before, but a kind of <clears throat> maybe corrective on sometimes how this particular passage or the yeah, how this particular passage gets spun out and interpretive, interpreted with the language of taking up your cross and follow me, that this is not some sort of glorification of suffering and that suffering that one must suffer to be able to be a true Christian uh, and suffer through whatever you're suffering through, because that's part of what, you know, is a part of following Jesus. This what you've just said is really helpful in that, that we recognize, I read in one commentary, that we recognize that the cross of Jesus has a purpose and a limit. I mean, it, and it's the result of the, it, it, it goes back to your, your observations about necessity and, and must, and what, what's the mustness in that? And, and to what extent that taking up your cross is choosing uh, to live a life or to follow a to follow a Jesus that is going to stand up against powers that would crush it and stand up against empire. And so to take up your cross is not necessarily a choice of suffering. It's a choice to speak out against suffering. <laughs> and so that I think, and navigating that homiletically I, I would be important, particularly as we already have mentioned that sort of retrospective hindsight of that we're not putting all of our eggs in the crucifixion back basket. I can't believe I just said that, but you know. Yeah. That's very ether like of you. That was that was so seasonal. See, that's so my seasonal. resurrection, you know, retrospective on the cross. Uh <laughs> and <laughs> but you know what I mean. I and and that 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 how is it that we help help people think about that space? Um yeah. And a bit of that might be just looking at what's happening in this scene with that in mind. So uh it looks like you know, Peter is coming to some understanding and he's paying close attention. And then he realizes, like so many others had, they expected a different kind of Messiah. Uh, the religious leaders expected a different kind of Messiah. They were in the midst of their suffering under the empire. And they expected that their Messiah would be a military might, would, would, you know, be the oppressor over their oppressors. And here Jesus is saying, um, what we now understand is um, Isaiah gave us what, what, you know, 
you need to expect me as the Messiah to be. The Messiah is going to suffer. And that suffering is actually our suffering. It is the suffering of God's people. It is the suffering of humanity. And the truth is, we don't want to suffer either. And so we'll spiritualize our suffering. But the reality is, is it's more navel gazing. And in some ways, that's what Peter was rejecting. No, this isn't the kind of Messiah we want you to be. If, if, you, if that's the way you're going to look at it, no. Let me, let me take you aside and remind you of who you are. And Jesus says, now you have the evil one's thoughts. Let me remind you what the prophets have said. And then our theology recognizes that that was done for us. And if we're going to talk about suffering like Christ, then it's the same it's the same um, expectation that was expected of the religious practices of, of, of ancient Judaism, and that is um, to care for the least, to feed the hungry, to set the captives free. So it's not my suffering, it's relieving the sufferings of others, because that's what Jesus did. He relieved our sufferings. And if we want to take up our cross, as he did, it's not about spiritualizing what's going wrong in my life. It's about making sure that things aren't going wrong in someone else's. Yeah, we're, we're pointing out the way in which it's really hard to talk about suffering as a general category when we're working mm -hmm. with the Bible, that the kind of suffering implied by taking up a cross is very different from uh, what it means to suffer from poverty, what it means to suffer from illness, what it means to suffer from from violence and abuse. This is a particular kind of stance against certain things and then a certain kind of pushback from that power uh, em embodied in crucifixion. So, um, yeah, I think if our preachers are going to go the self-denial route and talk about that part of the passage and losing one's life, that that we're really clear about what kind of suffering or what kind of quote unquote sacrifice we're, we're talking about. Because I think when we lump that together and talk about suffering in abstract ways, people's minds are gonna go a variety of directions depending upon what their lives are like. And, and mm -hmm. I don't ever read the New Testament as being that general when it talks about suffering. Sometimes when it's talking about persecution or the cost right. one has to pay for following Jesus, it's very right. uh, particularly defined like it is here so yeah and that's the yeah the particularity just once again that reminder of the particularity of the passage and how mm -hmm. where is it falling into uh into that larger narrative particularly of mark and mark's christology maybe one more one more item i would uh, oh, do you have another thing matt were you going to say something no no oh. i'm good <laughs> I, I know was going to talk about Abraham and Sarah, but we'd rather. Yeah, no, we need to go on. That. But the other, you know, the, sort of the other interpretive imagination that happens with this text is how to how to interpret Peter's rebuke. I mean, is it a resistance? Is it a? Is it you know? The, no, that's that can't happen. Like you were talking about joy, expectation. So it, it, I find that interesting in reading the commentaries. You know, what's the what's sort of. The, what is the motivation behind Peter's rebuke and what is he really rebuking? But one thing to just call attention to is that that word, that verb was, was just used by Jesus. He sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. He rebuked them not to tell anybody about them. And it's the verb that Jesus uses in his first, is his first uh, act in the gospel of Mark of, of rebuking of the evil spirits. Evil and spirit. so there's something there. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what yet, uh, but there's uh, but there's some sort of I think interpretive line that that uh, there's a, a connection that I would want to make, and I, I'm just throwing that out there. And I'm not I'm I'm going to let our our wonderful preachers with their imaginations take that somewhere. But this is not the only time that this verb is used in the Gospel of Mark. And so if you're if you're inclined in that direction, what are what are what is Peter, what is Peter's issue to put it in that larger context of how it's used in Mark might be helpful. So 
That's it. Abraham and Sarah. That's also paired up with Jesus speaking quite openly about what's going to happen to him. So there's exactly. some stuff that's silenced and rebuked and other stuff is let out. Yeah. You go back to the transfiguration, right? Listen to him is the right. is the line. Right. Lots of irony in all that. Okay. Yeah. Abraham and uh, Sarah. Genesis. So yeah, if I just see if my voice holds out. If I yeah. tie these tie this idea again, um, and I it it seemed to underscore what you were suggesting, Caroline, um, that um their expectations of what God was doing. And what God was actually doing had to be interpreted for them. So, you know, in Mark, Jesus is interpreting what they thought Isaiah was saying. And Jesus is more literal, you know, the suffering servant. But this reminds us that this has been God's plan all along. And so that the covenant that is being set uh, with Abraham and Abraham's offspring is a, a covenant that is without end. And God is faithful to that covenant in the same way that God, obviously this comes first, but as God will be faithful to all that God has said along the way. And um, when the people recognize, to, to go back to your statement, Caroline, the people get away from God's way, then they need to recognize, no, God is doing this. Uh, so the rebuke, the rebuke of the evil one, similarly the buke, rebuke of, of, of uh, Peter, but also uh, the silencing um, until the right time. Um, here, this covenant in 17 is all about Abraham and his descendants. Um, but we know from 12 and 15, they were being blessed for all the other nations. And it's important not to read 17 in isolation, just as it's important not to read um, suffering in isolation or the rebuke of Peter individually in isolation. I think all of these texts or any of these texts need to be read in the context um, that either we will be echoing and reminding folks of or echoing, echoing to introduce people to how to hear this text. Yeah, this covenant's not negotiated, right? It's no. declared from God, as, um, which is significant in that we don't get a lot of God's motivation <laughs> <laughs> it's just, this is how it's going to be. I'm going to do it this way. It wouldn't kill the preacher to add a verse or two, you know, at the <laughs> end of this also. Uh, if you love the idea of a hundred year old man falling on his face, laughing hysterically in the presence of God, you can get that in, um, in verse, in verse 17. And, and then where this is where Abraham says like, well, how about Ishmael? Uh, and then to have God correct that as well. So again, that's, that would maybe underscore the fact that this is not about a negotiation or an agreement. This is about God making a declaration. And it sounds ludicrous to Abraham. It sounds, Abraham seems to think he has a, a better idea or a simpler idea, uh, but God still has this sense of, oh, we're going to do it this way. Yeah, I, I think, I don't usually do this, as our listeners know, but uh, <laughs> one of the things that is you know, as I was looking ahead, we're going to get, of course, John 316 in a couple of weeks, and then the last Sunday of Lent from John, <clears throat> John 12, where you have now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks, which really confirms, we'll talk about, or I'll talk about, huh? uh, really confirms the statement of the Pharisees in the verse before, that the whole world is coming to Jesus. And that might be a, a Lenten theme that you would want to pursue too. I mean, one of the things that was, we've been, I mean, we've looked at this text so many times, but one of the things that I, I just, I don't know if I can like, like a circle, see, like, look. all right. So I, I mean, I just circled all the abundance in this 
right? Exceedingly numerous, multitude of nations, multitude of nations, exceedingly fruitful. Uh, I will make nations of you, everlasting covenant throughout their generations, offspring, bless, kings, bless. I mean, it's just like rhetorically so overwhelming with what how this covenant is going to go for future forever and ever and ever. And how is it that we that we are then in this space of that ongoing blessing of Jesus, of God, that ongoing um, promise of all nations uh, being in this relationship with God. So I was just, I was just really kind of struck by that, that um, this, that this covenant, while it is, you know, really non really negotiable um, and is full of uh, some problems and issues is this promise of an extraordinary amount of blessing that we just can't even imagine. Um, and, and the way in which that's, that that's happening now in Jesus, right. With a a following of Jesus, God's continued blessing, um, for all and how Paul is going to work that as uh, work that out as well. So anyway, it's a larger sort of theme, but I I don't know, you do like do all these connections, but anyway, I, I, I think if you're anticipating it, like you've, you know, we've looked at this before and, and we've been reading them. And when we start echoing, you know, the, the, the non-negotiable has always been, this is for all the world. You know, I'm blessing you. I'm a blessing you in this exceedingly abundant way. Mm-hmm. And uh, just like Peter was like, okay, our Messiah is here. I don't want you to do it this way. I don't think it'll work this way. And Jesus says, no, this is the way it's always going to be. And this is the way it will be. And so here it's actually, if we read 17 in isolation. um, So I I appreciate the adding of reminding Ishmael and Hagar, because Mm -hmm. if we read this in isolation, it's, you know, God saying, no, my plan was for the descendants of you, Abraham and Sarah. You tried to make it. That's going to be a problem, but I'm not going to abandon them because of this. But I'm still going to do this non-negotiable thing that I said. And it it confirms that this is for everyone. You know, I may, I'm blessing you for, for all the world. But it also uh, foreshadows that Israel's going to want to be great. They're going to want to be abundant. They're going to want to be blessed. And they don't want that to be for all the world. And so uh, if, if we look forward, as you've, you pointed us to, I think it's important that we echo this here in 17. This is for Abraham and Sarah. But don't forget, in 12, their blessing is for everybody else. Because what we're going to get in John 3 is for God so love the world. And when we do that back and forth, I think we can see, or I I begin to see why these texts are connected, weirdly, as the lectionary text connections always are. Well, speaking of weird, the lectionary was able to make Psalm 22 actually about praise. So it's uh, <laughs> nice when That's you weird. get the first 22 verses of a really, really tough psalm. But there's this, uh, you know, what, what's the response to that abundance, to all those things that you circled, Caroline? It's it's praise, right? So verse 23, uh, which extends to all you offspring of Israel, which uh, Christians can pick up and and say that that includes us in this in this odd history and i think although the psalm's not part of it that's part of the kind of the joy in the old testament too of a lot of old testament authors is this belief that it actually will extend that god's blessing um isn't just for israel alone but but extends more more broadly so this is a place where i think you just utterly ignore the first 22 verses of the psalm and just do just do what verse 23 says and verse 27 says and, and and so on. Well, and the, I think verse 30, future generations will be told about the Lord. And so that telling, as you were saying, Matt, that telling, that telling that is witnessed in, in the old Testament of the blessings of the Lord 
and that telling that is now happening uh, it, that hap- it, that happened in God's work in Jesus, but also the telling of uh, of what do we tell each other and uh, what do we how do we give witness to that? And so uh, that um, yeah, that promise of the future generations and and the fact that you know God God's vision for you know for God's soul of the world, you know we just can't even comprehend that that's just and how and then how is that i've talked about this before with john but how does that how does god loving the world happen without our witness in the world and so that's that's part of the connection to i was making with psalm 30 i mean psalm 22 verse 30 and it looks like the poor filled and satisfied mm-hmm. you know it, mm-hmm. it's tangible mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. should we talk about well, romans 4 yeah. I'm seeing a well, connection here. There's like Abraham and then there was You Abraham. think so? Yeah. It's a little bit more blatant. <laughs> well, this is um it's a tough text to follow somebody who's just dropping into Romans at this point and keeping track of of Paul's rhetoric here. But it's it's such an important Maybe not the text itself, but the idea of the text is such an important piece of how Christian faith developed. And so for people to understand this idea of how do Gentiles get included into this covenant is was not a simple discussion, something that Jesus didn't give a whole lot of explicit commands about in, in the Gospels, but is something the early church discerns, uh, not just through Paul, but of course, Paul's the, the one whose writings um survived and give give testimony to this but this idea of of God's righteousness and of God's commitment to humanity being so um reliable but also intense that it doesn't just flow through Abraham but it flows through Abraham in a way that's utterly inclusive and doesn't require uh one to surrender your personal identity in order to participate now in this new thing God's doing in Christ but oh, we're not going to end there. There's got to be more you can say about Romans 4. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm, I'm still in the same place where I am with, with, you know, what is it that, why is it that Abraham and Sarah are called? You know, it's for the, the, the um, nations that were scattered in Genesis 11. And so the law that was given was not their salvation. And when we read through all of the Old Testament, the people of God continue to fail. But God's um, God's covenant, to use your words, Matt, it's non-negotiable. Well, I, I was thinking about this. I was just actually in um, Greece and Turkey a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and uh, I've I've done you know I've done trips like this I've I've done a trip like this in the past where you go to ancient Corinth and 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 Athens and uh, and but I I this was also the first time I went to Ephesus and uh, but just thinking about and, and just even even looking at a map of the letters uh, the the you know the communities to which Paul wrote. And of course, had traveled and 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 sort of the imaginations or the figuring out. Okay, okay, how long did Paul stay here, and how long did Paul? Which really, I don't. It doesn't. That doesn't really do much for me. But anyway, might do much for other people. Nonetheless, Paul is like everywhere, right? I mean, when you look at the map, and I just how what I was struck by is that he's so that that what he's talking about here in Romans of this of this blessing for all nations and all descendants and and so numerous shall your descendants be that uh that he embodies that right in his ministry that he so he so much believes that that then then physically that's exactly what happens right that the gospel gets spread out uh, and God's love gets spread out everywhere, and uh, and I think we, you know, we we intellectualize this so much sometimes with mm. the, the promises of God, and that, but when you actually can see it on a map and travel, <laughs> right, and travel to these places, and you realize that sort of um, that embodied mission of Paul. 
that was so inspired and so caught up in this absolute belief of 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 God's extension of God's love through for all people through Jesus it's really kind of kind of moving